Devin Townsend is known for blending instruments and genres in his own way. He's developed a unique sound that's all his own, and he's done it by cutting through the lies we tell ourselves, not following the rules someone else made up. Great mixers, they will just get stuff into the session that they know works. And if something doesn't work, they will figure out something that will work instead of keeping something that doesn't work. It's not super obvious if you have these rules in your head. Listen to Devin explain how he started demoing the drums and then at a place you probably would not expect. Demo state for this song happened in three sections as far as I can remember. And the first was a completely different song. The first was the verse, and it was very much a demo. I'm fortunate to have a bunch of fantastic drummers in my world. Morgan Ogren is a, a, a good friend of mine. And so he's got a studio set up in his garden shed in Sweden. And it's a good sound, but when I do demos, I just ask him to, to play over it, and I'll get back either a stereo mix or maybe four tracks, you know, kick, snare, room. And the thought in the beginning was that would be a demo that I would take uh, and that we would track elsewhere. But Morgan and I have recorded a bunch of records together and whenever I go into a studio with him, the vibe that he's able to achieve when he's on his own is much more intimate. And so when I had done the demo for what ends up being the verses of Lightworker, the stereo mix was the one that I thought was the most appropriate. Devin uses a couple different methods to create the sounds in his head and keep his eyes from tricking himself. Have you heard the difference when you feel knobs as opposed to watching the spectrum? Well, let's see how he does it. You'll notice as well on every channel, and this is new to me, but I gotta say how much I love it. Every channel we've got this. And what this is, is it corresponds to this unit right here. So basically what this is, is this SSL strip and it's like a typical SSL EQ, the compressor, the dynamics. In the middle here is a bus compressor that you can add to anything with like a moving needle. And each one of these things, when I move it, you'll see it shows up there and it's the shit. And then also I've got this soft tube version of it right here, which is, it's a tactile control surface. And what I've got that one set up for is a Neve style strip. So basically you'll see on like the the auxiliaries here, this thing called console one. And so when I put this up, I've got the ability to do, and I've got this set up as like a Neve uh, plugin. And so, you know, you've got your, your high frequencies here and, and you've got the more sort of Neve-ish low mids and mids. And then there's a shelf on the low end here that's kind of like a Neve character. And so in a sense, it's almost like having that as a, an insert. So if I want that kind of character in the high end of a Neve, I just use this one. And then for every other channel, I've basically got an SSL strip that I can just go here. And man, I gotta say, it's like to be able to mix that way is crazy. And what I do find as well is that, and I've only had it for a while, so it's it's I'm still learning how to integrate it, but immediately I was like, wow, I know what I wanna hear. And then when I do the things that I, I know that I want to hear, and then I look at what I've done, I'm like, wow, I would have never done that. It's like common sort of sense and all the things that you read about in terms of how to gulp your frequencies and all this. It's like, you'd never go that much. You'd never put that much 8K on something. You'd never take away that much low end. But when I'm just listening and I'm not like watching it, I find that everything gets like bigger. It's really cool, man. Your eyes uh, play tricks on your ears, I've noticed. So I feel like there's a lot of truth to what you're saying. And I think it's because when you take your eyes out of the equation, it opens up your brain ram to really be able to interpret what you're the hearing. Only, the only thing I want to be able to really see is just an overall frequency, right? Mm -hmm. Just in case there's something that I'm missing. Makes sense. And, uh, and a lot of times that's just, you know, I'll, I'll get to the point where things are slowly starting to come together. And I'm like, well, there's things that are a little muddy and it's probably between the, the kick and the bass. And then I can, when I solo anything, what comes up on that spectrum analysis is just gonna be that thing, right? So because it's at the very end, say we were to do, um, then I can see just what the snare is doing. I see what it's doing up in the top there. And and so always having that going is, is, is like a really great way for me to be able to identify any particular problems that I may not have caught, right? I've got some buddies that are really old school with it that hate spectrum analysis. They're just like, you shouldn't be looking at that. You shouldn't be looking at it. But I like it, so fuck it. There you go. That's one of those rules that someone just made up. Yeah, there's a lot of those, man. But I think that the hybrid between I love being able to 
listen and EQ and compress that way, but I also like to be able to see it, right? The drums in this song were recorded differently for each part. The choruses were recorded in a massive studio with a million mics and drums to choose from. Would you automatically think those tracks would give you exactly what you want? Maybe not. Devin does something you've probably heard not to do. For example, in this song, because it was so wide open, I found there were frequencies in the cymbals that were troublesome because it accented a bunch of stuff that was in opposition to some of the, the synth tracks for me. So I found that just having some digital cymbals was really, it cleaned it up for me. So I just redid things. And plus I got to the point where this section of the song, once it had been tracked, was all crash cymbal. When you say that it clashed with the synth, yeah. do you mean like the up there was like frequency clashing? That's what I felt, yeah. Okay. So, uh, and then hi-hats tend to be really trashy just in general. So I gave myself an option for a digital hi-hat that was closed as opposed to open. Because when we had tracked the stuff, it was, we had tracked it open, right? Like. And then I just found that I, I preferred it closed, so I just went ahead and added a digital closed symbol. I found with this song that we, we, you know, we were in this big fancy studio and we had all these symbol selections. I didn't really love the symbols. So as opposed to chastising myself, but it's like clearly this is a problem with me because it was an incredible studio and it's incredible studios um, or symbols. I'm like, yeah, but I don't like it, so I'll replace it. And that's what I did. Thanks for checking out this video. I'm Ryan with URM Academy, and I wanted to try something different for the format of this clip. Let me know in the comments if you enjoyed this style of presentation. Subscribe to Nail the Mix if you want to see the entire unedited live mix, and I'm going to leave you with a final thought from Devin. Dude, and also there's a certain amount where you're talking about phase earlier, like, you know, I've, I've subscribed subscribe to a bunch of audio engineers channels on YouTube. And, and if you go by that, it seems like, oh, there is rules in order for things to sound good. But I also find that sometimes I'll do something, maybe it is out of phase. I'm like, I think it sounds great. And it's, it's really comes down to, do you think it sounds good? That's it.